Hello, and thanks again for joining us at the Donahue Group, or with the Donahue Group. Uh, we're uh, here for a fast-paced half hour of conversation regarding all sorts of interesting things. And as we discovered on the last show, we never get off topic because <laughs> the, economic the, world, development. the yeah. world is our, at, the world is our topic. <laughs> economic development. Joining me in being off yeah. task uh, this uh, show, Ken Risto, Curriculum and Assessment Specialist in the Social Studies area for the Sheboygan Area School District. Excellent. I did it. Perfect. There you go. Tom Paneski, a humble math professor at Correct. the University of Wisconsin Sheboygan campus. Cal Potter, former state senator, former assistant superintendent of libraries, libraries for the Technology and Community Learning. Thank you. Technology, Technology and Community, community learning, learning for the Department of Public Instruction. Me, I'm just a lawyer. So, in any event, we're here to talk about some interesting state. We might even branch out into just some interesting national issues uh, in the brief period of time that we have. Um, we're coming off a most, most, most interesting election. Nobody was talking about, at least that I heard, about the Wisconsin State Senate shifting. And if you look at the election returns, the State Assembly with just a few votes, I'm going to go through my pile and just read a couple of Assembly District results, could have shifted fairly dramatically. Why? Cal, Tom, Ken, why wasn't anybody talking about the state senate as Nobody a possible? Polls. I don't think well, I, there's not a whole lot of polls. I was not surprised. The reason okay. I wasn't surprised is because the, some of the seats that were up were seats that were held by uh, Democrats in the past. Uh, the Racine seat, for example. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, remember that went from Joe Stroll to PTAC mm -hmm. uh, and then to, to Kim Plocky, Right. then Republican. Now it's back to Democrat again. So it's a, a, a district very much uh, slightly Democrat. So that going back, uh, if you look at the, the Eau Claire area, uh, Rod Moan was defeated by uh, this was it a fire chief, I believe, I believe I he was. Know. Now he was defeated after one term. So these are districts that had a potential uh, to swing and have swung in the past. And then the second point is that the Democrats were very elated by the well-known uh, nature of the candidates that they fielded and the quality. And there were some very good people. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that they had anything to, uh, to work with. They had people there who could fend for themselves against an incumbent. And when they spoke uh, were impressive and the voters reacted positively. I mean, in the case of Zine, uh, to me, the guy was waiting to be defeated. I mean, he. You think? Yeah, well, he had, over the years, he made a, a life of a concealed carry and a few issues. And I think eventually, after I don't know how many years he had been in there, eight or 10 years, um, it's, it would have to be 12, um, he would be it would caught up to him, I think. Yeah. yeah. So oh. I think the, the, the swing of three seats. Was a, was, a, was a potential that was there. And with what, what is even some of the uh, Republican advisors said that uh, Iraq meant about 5% on the national level to Republican losses. So if, if that extrapolates in any way down the, down the pipeline, mm -hmm. you can feel that uh, in some of these marginal Republican Democrat seats, uh, this should not have been that big of a surprise. And in the assembly, um, there were a number of seats um, uh, where the, if the Democrats had had another two or 300 votes, there were any number of assembly seats that could have turned. And greedy. You're greedy. <laughs> well, yeah. I think from my own perspective, no, when you have the, the legislative body and the executive branch all of the same party, there's mischief. Uh, it's too much power. The checks and balances are really pretty sorry. I think we saw that certainly on the national level. Yep. And when one party is, I mean, there's nothing wrong with partisan governing. They become fat cats and too comfortable exactly. and start taking care of themselves rather than people's business exactly. when it goes on for too long. Yeah, sure. and so I think to have, to have a mix, you know, mm -hmm. certainly makes some sense. And um, so I think on the national level, I sure like the mix. And sure. uh, it'll be interesting because uh, it's just no good when one party is in power. You don't get that partisanship that if it's done right, 
leads to decent compromise and, and decent legislation being proposed and, and the process working better. But uh, in any event, so the state Senate has gone from um, 14 Democrats to 18 Democrats, uh, Republicans from 19 down to 15. And then the assembly itself. <clears throat> um, Five vote pickup for Democrats. They, they did really much better. Um, they had 39 seats, now they've got 46. The, Demo <clears throat> or the Republicans had 60 and now they have 52. And so it's, yeah. it's, it's, a closer, yeah. it's a closer race and so I think we'll all be the better for it. Um, we'll see a lot different in, in dynamics now because uh, the veto pen that the governor was wielding over the last uh, couple of years was something that he was, he was the stop block. Now the uh, state senate can play that role in many cases. So the role that the governor played and the criticisms that he got that somehow he was stopping things, um, I think we'll, we'll see a different approach to, to legislation in this next session. And Doyle showed, I thought, surprising strength. Um, I mean, everyone said it was going to be razor, razor, razor thin. Well, it wasn't. Um, mm -mm. Uh, 53, 45, and then I think the green guy got uh, Nelson. I want to say Mandela. Nelson. Mandela. No. <laughs> no, no that's right. he wasn't. Right. Yeah, <laughs> Nelson Algren. No, Nelson no, Rockefeller. author. But uh, I mean, that just shows Admiral how Nelson. we don't pay attention to third-party mm -hmm. candidates. But uh, but he pulled a few votes. So I think Doyle did come out much better mm -hmm. than than any of us really had expected. And um, um, in part, it may be your theory that Green just held on to his wanting his four hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars that the elections board took away from him. I don't know, but. Uh, I don't think Green ever caught on. I, I think where he was strong, Doyle was strong. Where he was weak, Doyle was weak. And I, he also had baggage that uh, yeah. when he was in a Republican, a very strong Republican congressional district, he could get away with voting for big oil, drug companies, and whatever. And when that started now being played statewide, that this is how he voted. Uh, there were people who were saying, wait a minute, I believe uh, we need uh, more extensive stem cell research. His votes in Congress didn't uh, reflect that. I think people uh, said we need health care and we need a better drug plan than we have. His votes in Congress didn't reflect that. So I think uh, he, had, he was cloistered away in a congressional district where he could survive probably in each democratic challenge on those issues. But statewide, when you look at why people voted the way they did, Iraq war was the major reason. But there are people who are concerned about uh, their drug costs and their health care costs and stem cell research and a number of other issues that I think the Republicans just did not reflect a more progressive viewpoint on some of those issues uh, that they should have. Mm -hmm. And it caught up with them, I think. Yeah, yeah. The, I, think, yeah oh, I think Green, I think, really didn't run a very coherent campaign. Um, the state wasn't in such a terrible mess that people were willing, they had to have a pretty compelling reason to vote against oil, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, I think some of the things that I thought Green was going to latch onto, um, you know, again, whether they were distortions or whether they're accurate records, you know, about tuition increases at, at the UW system and those kinds of things, I thought had some legs. But it seemed like it was very scattered. Uh, I'm going to try to take some shots to see if something gets going here. But there really wasn't a consistent message um, beyond, you know, uh, Doyle being corrupt. And by the time Doyle's team responded, that ended up being a wash. Yeah. They, were both, they were both portrayed as They're both portrayed as that. So <laughs> there's no reason to throw that bomb out because I'm just putting another bomb in. Yeah. Uh, and then I think, again, to beat the, this old dead horse, I think it's really tough to, to call the other guy corrupt. Even and you know and then talk about how I want four hundred thousand dollars of campaign contributions. Most people didn't pay attention to all the history of what led to that decision and how partisan that may or may not have been. All of that, when a, they just see a politician with four hundred thousand dollars want you know laying around that they want to get their hands on, and it just doesn't. It just it, it seems just a little bit too contradictory for mm -hmm. most average folks walking down the street. Uh, and some of the groups, I think, so. probably misplayed their cards. I think the NRA, my newspaper one day, came wrapped in a plastic bag that said, Dump Doyle, he doesn't like guns. And um, they had big full-page ads against Doyle because of mm -hmm. his of opposition to concealed carry. Well, actually, polls showed that 60, 70% of the people didn't want concealed carry. So. You know, you start beating right. up on somebody who, who people felt had a reasonable approach to this, 
Um, I think he had friends that, uh, some groups that attacked him. Uh, he, they couldn't overcome the fact that people thought he took a reasonable approach to some of these issues. Mm -hmm. I, think, and I think you're right about the stem cell vote, and I think the Michael J. Fox ad really mm -hmm. changed some minds near the end. I think there was a little tipping point there. Um, I don't have any. Well, I'm just the baggage from Congress. Yeah. You think so? Yeah. Well, and that, and, yeah. and uh, you're right, the Iraq War, and Let's segue. he never came out. Yeah. He never stood out. Yeah. Never yeah. rose to the top, so oh. I want to vote for Green. Let's just segue. Um, I made a point of looking only at the ads that were on Channel 12 between 6.30 and 7 in the morning when the TV set was on. And, and other than Doyle's ad with his two kids, which I thought was pretty that was cool. That very nice ad. Um, yeah. And uh, pretty heartfelt. Um, and that's when you knew that he was going to win. Yep, yep, you knew that, yeah. Because they must have had the polling data to show that they mm -hmm. had a pretty that, comfortable lead. Because they went if you're nice running, early on. Yeah, if you're running, you're running the, you know, me and the, me and the kids, and yeah. he's a great dad, and, you know, he's like Fred McMurray and my three sons, <laughs> only one son short. And you see that, and then you, see, and you still see, you yeah, know, Green that, continuing to do the sort of attack ads. Uh, Good point. You, knew, you knew that this election, uh, that's when I sat up and said, well, this is over. Yeah. Uh, These oh, guys well, know what I, what I already know. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of read the ads and the tenor of the ads, and it gives you a sense of how desperate or how difficult campaigns yeah. are in. So. Well, it leads to, um, and I'm sure without much difficulty, we could sit down and figure out how much the campaign cost, divide the number million. of divide the number of voters in and find out you know, how much each vote cost in, in one way or the other. Uh, both the Journal Sentinel and the Sheboygan Press on the day after, two days after the election, came out with editorials on now is the time for campaign finance mm -hmm. reform. Jay Heck had a piece in um, the uh, Sunday Milwaukee Journal. Sunday, Sunday. Milwaukee Journal. Um, even before the election, Ellis and Erpenbach came out with plans again or indicated their desire to do real campaign finance reform. There's now a split legislature, which gives you at least some play back and forth. Will it happen? Uh, should it happen? Um, what will it look like? Uh, can we go another two years or four years just with this same old stuff? I guess that's my question to, to this yeah. erstwhile panel here. Or is See, it just so I hum -hum? I mean, I don't, I don't get hung up on the campaign finance reform issue. Uh, I. Let people do it. Let them fight for campaign finance reform. I don't. I, I think they tread on uh, First Amendment rights real easily when they start playing that game. So I, I don't. Uh, I'd, I'd kind of stay away from campaign finance reform. I think the record-setting amount spent in this gubernatorial race uh, will simply escalate further, and mm -hmm. what it means is that as the numbers get bigger, bigger, and double-digit millions means you shake down the special interest groups even harder and earlier, um, and that means you're more beholden to them. I don't care what anybody says. When you're getting money from big oil or big drug companies or whoever it happened to be, uh, when a vote comes up and you've been given millions of dollars, uh, you'd have to be dumber than a box of rocks to think <laughs> that you're not going to somehow give consideration to the group that gave you that money. Oh, I've been in the room. I've been in the room. I sat and asked the legislators, you know, here's the 30 things that uh, we act wants. You know, what's your views on them? And we're scoring them. I mean, it's like a clipboard. I'm going, yes, mm -hmm. no, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. And they leave the room and, you know, well, what do you think the message is? Is if you don't tell us what we want to hear, do you think we're going to give you any kind of endorsement mm -hmm. to our membership? Or are you going to get any kind of money from the, the political action committees of the association? All right. I'm, so sure that, I'm, I'm sure it's on the, and, you know, there's nobody saying if you do this, we're going to give you this money. Nobody's that dumb. But that's, that's, that's the reality of it, and I'm sure the Wisconsin Association of Manufacturers isn't doing it any differently. Yeah. And those are the two biggest uh, political action committee groups in, in the state. With the casinos right behind. Yeah. Um, remember we talked in past shows about the faith uh, of the Wisconsin electorate and its legislature to do the right thing, to do things for constituents instead of for naked self-interest is 6%. 6% of the people think that that legislators will so act, so the other 94% do not. Um, uh, there seems to be a disconnect between the, the, is the cynicism so deep, 
and so entrenched that people just think it can't be cured. And so their interest in real campaign finance reform is not that great. Campaign finance reform is not going to cure human nature. I think human nature is such, like you say, you're going to be beholden to somebody, you're going to do what you think is best or what is, you know, you're in the office, you was, want to keep your office. Was Bill Proxmire beholden? I remember, and, and now Bill You got was, a unique individual in Bill Proxmire. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And Herb Cole. Herb Cole. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Herb Cole, yeah, he's got a lot of money, he can run his own campaign. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, so mm -hmm. he doesn't have to be beholden to anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. I, uh, I think the electorate, after every so often, says, well, I know people are going to take advantage of the situation, so we vote them out. But doesn't it change the, <laughs> doesn't it change the dynamics, though, if, if, if uh, there's some sort of meaningful campaign finance, which includes public financing of campaigns? You know, we've got to put that on the table, I would think. You got to get the money from someplace, unless you set up a situation where people are forced to accept very, very small donations and they're forced to broaden their base. And I think you'd almost have to have as a piece of it uh, a complete or a very severe well, limitation of outside four sources of money coming in and helping you. I mean, but I mean doesn't you, that change the dynamics? Now I'm listening mean, let's, to let's, what my people in my district want as opposed to what REAC wants or what Wisconsin know, Association of Manufacturing wants. I mean, you were on the local level, but what do you do with a George Soros who says, I'll just give the Democratic Party, you know, 20 million bucks in there. Well, that's so, what I'm saying. You know, I mean, what do you, that, is that, yeah, I mean, you have to have that a, if he wants? You, you sure can. I agree. I <laughs> agree can. that you're absolutely right. If it's not a, if it's not a meaningful package of, con, you know, a comprehensive reform, you're just going to be shifting money and giving one right. team advantage over the it's other. It's a shell There's game. no question. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no and question I think that's it. what McCain-Feingold did. In, in but, many respects. But I'm, you know, and, and I, I also think you're right that it, uh, giving the existing Supreme Court, I'm not quite sure if a meaningful package like we're talking about is going to challenge, uh, is going to survive a First Amendment challenge. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth, you know, finding out, but I, I think you're absolutely right. I think the court will strike it down. But uh, personally, I don't know why anybody should be allowed to come into my congressional district or my Senate, state senatorial district and whether it be, you know, a guy like George, you know, who's a liberal yeah. Democrat, yeah. Or whether it be, you know, name your favorite, you know, conservative who's throwing money around. In any, you know, the money should only come from the from the, the district, from, the district it, from which I mean, that's the way it should be crafted, and the reporting laws should be immediate. The, the we money, have the technology to do yeah, that. And the but the money produces really stupid results. Uh, and the the money is used for television advertisements that by their nature, in order to be successful, misrepresent, mm -hmm. dumb down, cloud, and just in general, bring down the, the quality and the level of the political system. Tell me, those of you more learned than I, in England, it is my understanding that campaign seasons are sharply limited. That's correct. It's six weeks or three weeks? Yes, that, it's that very short. Okay, if you want to do campaign finance, not fi campaign reform, strike finance. Well, and then <laughs> and then make the TV stations. I mean, if they're for every dollar that they receive in advertising income, they're required to provide you know a half an hour. Well, not for every dollar, but in a, if you see my point, mm -hmm. which is that you provide free time to candidates and even some of the nutty ones, you know, or the third party candidates that um, deserve to be heard and whether they're the Libertarians or the Green Party or Ed Thompson or whoever it is, is that you make everybody part of the debate. I, I mean, it's just, there are different ways to approach it. For the Supreme Court to say, as it has in the past, that, that free speech and money are the same, uh, to me, is, is a distortion. I think a different court could certainly you know, come to a different point of view. Well, let the media stations, the newspapers and the radio outlets and the TV offer Free ad time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no, they won't do gonna, that. That's that's, that's, a, that's a cash cow. Yeah. That's right. mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't want to give that away. Yeah, there's a lot of no. Obviously, <laughs> I mean, that's for financial interest. There's, yeah. I mean, I mean, the advertising firms that create these these ads that's make huge amounts of money. Um, you know, you've got lots of folks who benefit from the from, from the, the monster that's been created here.
But the mm -hmm. timing on this issue is very important because yep. the further we get down into the next mm -hmm. session, the more people have raised money that if they were were to enact reform becomes illegal, cannot be used. Yeah. You got the, the green issue, you know, how can you transfer uh, oh, illegal yeah. money or whatever? Legal and money. So you really need to uh, do something quickly. Yeah. Well, and there was strong support for the uh, merger of the state ethics or the recreation of the state ethics board and the state elections board. And so that may not be clearly unreasonable. And I think Ellis, Mike Ellis, always acts like he has nothing to lose, and I don't think he does. Mm -hmm. um, and Urbanbach comes from a pretty safe district. And to bring that back, uh, and then the folks, I remember in a previous program, railing against the people who had killed the bill in the assembly, but during their campaigns were... Um, uh, all for it. We're all yeah. for it, and yeah. how could the legislature have done that when, in fact, you know, they there was that cynicism, <laughs> you know, that was just so stunning and breathtaking to me. But so um, Senate Bill One, as it was called in those days, I don't think is um, it's not that revolutionary, uh, and maybe it's a small step forward. Um, I was interested in your comment that the Republicans and Democrats fielded good candidates, and we've talked about, you know just not having competitive races, and that'll always, I think, to some extent be the case. But, I mean, there were genuinely competitive races, um, as, as we saw. Let's just go back a little bit and talk about the, um, um, the, the one Republican bright spot, and it took an awfully long time uh, to, to come uh, to, mm -hmm. to bear uh, Van Hollen beating uh, Kathleen Falk by pretty slim pretty slim majority. In, in fact, I, it's my understanding she would have been entitled to an automatic recount because it was less than one and a half percent of the votes cast and so the cost would have been borne by the state. And it took her a long time to decide and I'm sure it was a careful decision. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts? Why did nobody knows who J.B. Van Hollen is? Um, maybe not that many more people know who Kathleen Falk was. Why did he win? Uh, in, in, within democratic circles, I think uh, she never did garner the votes of support that other democratic uh, statewide candidates got. I mean, she didn't get obviously what Cole got or Doyle got, and uh, people who have done analysis of that will look at places where there have been demo where democratic uh, strongholds like Dane County, um, and say that uh, she never did uh, uh, endear herself to those who thought she never should have run against incumbent uh, Peg Lautenschlager in the first place. So you start, you know, saying she lost, what, by 9,000 votes. Um, I'm sure you can find 9,000 people out there in Fond du Lac County uh, where Peg Lautenschlager is from and maybe that whole area of 6th District where she ran in for fairly decently for a congressional bid one time um, in Dane County um, that she just couldn't pick up all the Democratic votes that she needed to have in order to beat uh, mm -hmm. in a state that can go either way, uh, be, be the prosecutor who had some very hard-hitting ads about her uh, lack of prosecutorial uh, experience and things of that nature. Even though the attorney general is an administrator. Is, yeah, should not be agency. prosecuting cases, right. but uh, in that's any right. event, yeah. And that's exactly right. And I don't think Falk, <clears throat> I think Falk waited way too long to respond to those types of things. And then when she did, um, I think it's hard for, again, unfairly probably, I think it's hard for a woman to go negative. And when she did, it was rather late in the game, and I, I, I'm not quite sure that was the right response. I think she waited too long to respond to some of the accusations about her, uh, that she would be supporting, or she did support when she was Assistant Attorney General, frivolous lawsuits. Mm -hmm. I think she could have substantively responded to that and said, looked in the camera and said, you know, here's the kind of frivolous lawsuits we're talking about. Yeah. And lay out the case and say, now if my attorney, my opponent thinks that this is frivolous, then is that the kind of person you want for attorney general? Because that's what an attorney general does, makes those kind of substantive decisions. Yeah. And actually never ever responded to that charge at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, on its merits. Mm -hmm. And I think, a, a, I hate to say it, but I think a woman candidate comes off much more uh, appealing to the average voter if they do that than to, to, to sort of respond in kind saying, well, he let off a murderer or something like that. Mm -hmm. And now we get into a tit for tat about, about that issue. And, and in the midst of that, people still say, well, she never prosecuted a case and she seems to be kind of weak on crime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, know? I mean, I didn't know who Van Hollen was before this election. Yeah. I knew who Peg Lautenschlager was because she's the attorney yeah. general. So 
I really don't know why he won unless, you know, there's some, that, like you know, Cal says, the Democratic Party is yeah. disappointed that the, some of the members in the Democratic Party are disappointed that Peg had a, an opponent and that she got beat. Mm -hmm. uh, but maybe the crime issue that I, I do remember those ads. Uh, mm -hmm. Kathleen Falk is never prosecuted, never, fr those still, you know, I've done this, I've done this, says J.B. Van Hollen. She, I'm trying Falk? to tie him to Bush, too, was particularly ineffective, I thought. There yeah. was one series of ads or one ad that they ran for a while where they say he's a Bush nominee. Bush nominated him to, oh. uh, the, you know, his, his attorney's position, and, and they had a picture of him staying next to Bush. If you've got a voting record like we talked about with Mark Green, maybe that flies. If you've got Bush coming in and trying to raise money for you and you're standing next to him, I'm sure Van Hollen was on the stage somewhere, but I'm sure he was smart enough to stay outside the camera angle. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was particularly ineffective. What too. is Falk's future? You know, she came out of the Democratic gubernatorial primary four years ago, pretty strong, I and mean, she got in very, very late. Mm -hmm. Came in third, but a respectable third, and and seemed to be a rising star. And all tales being told, seems to be doing a good job as Dane County exec. Two strikes and you're out, Cal. What do you think? I think she'll have a tough time doing another statewide race as a Democrat mm -hmm. because. Uh, uh, the wounds that are still there will take a while to heal. I mean, she's, uh, uh, I think, got a niche that she can play in Dane County, but I think she's going to have to uh, go back and do some seriously, mm -hmm. serious uh, fence mending amongst Democrats in order to uh, be a winner on the ticket. Yeah. Big challenges ahead for the legislature and the, and the governor. Uh, $1.6 billion dollar uh, revenue deficit being projected again. Um, yeah, I thought we were balanced budget at the election time, and then after the election time, it's back to deficit. Well, this is for the future budget, I think. Oh, the, I know, the, I know. The, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the feds are cutting back, but, and the feds uh, on medical assistance, Medicaid, are really taking the states to task. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we have a population that uh, needs that those dollars and. That is just one of the big ticket items that they have to rest with. Yeah. Well, we often ask, why in the world would you want to be a legislator? One of the reasons is, is because if you don't take your sick days, you can convert them into uh, payments toward health insurance premiums. This um, has just really kind of caught on fire in the last couple of days, kind of, but does it remind you of the Tom Ament um, uh, pension business. I mean, mm -hmm. is this an issue that the that the voters are going to be really outraged about and take some steps to change? Do you think, or is it just one of those little flash fires that'll that'll settle down? Well, the holidays are coming, and pretty soon <laughs> visions of sugar plums will <laughs> dance. Around. You know, I don't think I, I think some people will always be concerned because uh, people are cashing in for something. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what was really uh, infuriating people is. Are these people not that sick? You know, there was a kind of the article in the mm -hmm. Milwaukee Journal Sentinel gave the implication that people were out, people were not there when they should have been there, and they should have had their sick days docked, and it, and it wasn't It wasn't docked. done. Right. That's oh, okay. what's going to get people, I think, right. very angry because they're, they're juking the system and they're not playing by the rules. Right. There's lots of, of, of public employees, and I was, I, even private employees, that can take sick days and convert them into something. You know, whether it be a cash stipend or whatever. Well, all state be. employees can. Yeah. yeah. It, well, this state employee can't. Well, and we're going no, to. I mean, no, I mean, Wisconsin. I mean, that. I worked for the university yeah. for 39 years here, and yeah. uh, I never took a sick day. Yeah, so I have them, a nice right? little you collection lose them, of sick days. You, you use them or you lose them. You well, know, but I wasn't looking we're, to use them, but we're I We're wrapping use them. up. Sure. We're wrapping up, and we'll see where we go with this the next time we come back. Thanks for joining us.